Hello, everyone. Welcome to you. <laughs> so nice to see you again. We are uh, gathered at this hour to learn about psychedelics, the uh, zeitgeist of the time. We have some really fabulous presentations uh, coming up for you today. And we're going to start with Nick Denemy. And you want to come up to the stage, Nick? He's going to talk to us today about the importance of psychedelics in understanding neurotransmission. So let's give a nice warm welcome to Nick. Okay, thank you very much for that warm introduction. Um, again, my name is Nick Denemy. I am a graduate student in pharmacology from the University of Michigan. Uh, and today I'm going to give a talk titled The Tools of Perception. Uh, and it's going to be a historical reminder of how important psychedelics have been in shaping um, our understanding of monoamine neurotransmission and the biochemical basis of behavior. So psychedelic drugs have long served as vital tools to study things like the neural correlates of consciousness, uh, which we heard a lot about today from uh, colleagues like Dr. Carhart Harris and others. But they've also been vital for understanding uh, neurotransmission, as well as our biochemical basis of behavior and mental illness. I want to start by doing some nomenclature uh, and defining where the term psychedelic came from. So the term psychedelic was actually coined by a psychiatrist named Humphrey Osmond, um, and he was good friends with a famous author named Aldous Huxley. Um, they, in the mid-1950s, uh, had experience with psychedelics, and they were disappointed with the term psychotomimetic. So uh, hallucinogens were deemed psychotomimetic in the clinical and scientific literature due to their ability to imitate psychosis. But Aldous Huxley and Humphrey Osmond didn't like this term. They wanted a better definition that represented more positive aspects of psychedelics. So they had extensive correspondence in the mid-1950s, and they exchanged poems to suggest a new term. And Aldous Huxley suggested to make this trivial world sublime, take a half a gram of phenarathon. Now, even though he was the author, uh, Humphrey Osmond one-upped him, and he said to fathom hell or go angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. Now, this was presented a year later at the New York Academy of Sciences, uh, and it stuck. So the great psychedelic chemist, Alexander Shulgin, once said, if there's confusion in defining psychedelics, then there's chaos in defining their effects. So as a pharmacology student, I like to uh, turn to something we call the Bible, uh, which is known as Goodman and Gilman's pharmacological basis of therapeutics. And an older edition has a really beautiful definition of psychedelics that I like. Uh, they define psychedelic effects by saying the feature that distinguishes psychedelic agents from other classes of drugs is their capacity reliably to induce or compel states of altered perception, thought, and feeling that are not experienced otherwise except in times of dreams or religious exaltation. Now, again, I really enjoy that definition because it highlights you know, the positive therapeutic uh, potential of psychedelics. So now that we've cleared some nomenclature, I wanna tell two short stories um, that highlight the vital influence of psychedelics in our understanding of monoamine neurotransmission. And so the first story is gonna be uh, about our understanding of serotonin. Now, serotonin's origins begin with a brilliant Italian chemist named Vittorio Erspammer. Vittorio Erspammer uh, discovered and identified dozens of bioactive compounds from animal tissues. And in the late 30s, he was working on a histochemical characterization of enterochromaffin cells. And he identified a compound, which at the time he didn't know the structure of, um, but he knew it had an amine group and that it caused contraction of the intestines. So he named it enteramine. And well, this is a modern picture of enteramine present in enterochromaffin cells. Now, simultaneously around the same time, Albert Hoffman was searching for a new circulatory and respiratory stimulant, uh, and he was synthesizing a series of lysergic acid derivatives. Now, the 25th series, or the 25th compound in this series, uh, was the famous lysergic acid diethylamide. Now, although he had submitted it for testing uh, to rodents in preclinical pharmacology at Sandoz, uh, nothing interesting was found with LSD. And so when compounds are submitted to preclinical testing and there's nothing interesting discovered, they're typically dead in the water. Um, but surprisingly and very interestingly, according to Hoffman, he had a peculiar presentiment that led him to resynthesize LSD five years later. Now, 
He accidentally absorbed some LSD on April 16th, 1943. Uh, and three days later, uh, which was uh, on this day yesterday, uh, he performed the famous self-experimentation uh, that we now call Bicycle Day. And so he discovered the remarkable psychoactive properties of LSD. Now he shortly after submitted LSD to the superiors at Sandoz and they began clinical testing. And in 1947, um, they published the results to the world uh, and Werner Stoll published a clinical trial titled LSD, a Fantasticum of the Ergot Group. And so the remarkable effects of LSD were presented to the world. Now around the same time, a team led by a man named Irving Page at the Cleveland Clinic in, in 1948, was investigating a vasoconstrictive substance that, substance that caused contraction of the blood vessels. Now this substance was isolated from serum at an increased vascular tone, so they named it serotonin. They discovered the structure a year later uh, in Maurice Report, who was the chemist of the group, determined that 5-hydroxytryptamine was serotonin. And it was shortly thereafter confirmed that erspamers in teramine was also 5-hydroxytryptamine. Now in 1953, shortly after, the discovery that serotonin was present in the brain was independently discovered by two groups. The first was the group I just mentioned, led by Irving Page, and he had a, a brilliant graduate student named Betty Twarg, and she had a very uh, sophisticated and sensitive bioassay that could detect different uh, amounts of serotonin in tissues. And she hypothesized that serotonin was present in the brain, and despite skepticism from her advisor, she did the experiments anyways and discovered that there was serotonin uh, in the brain of many different mammals. Now, John Gadam was over at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, and he also independently discovered that serotonin was present in the central nervous system of mammals and in the brain. Now, this is where psychedelics become important because John Gadam also had experience with LSD. So it was discovered later on in his laboratory notebook that the same year he discovered serotonin in the brain, uh, he was doing self-experimentation with LSD. Uh, and this is now held at the Royal Society, but in his notebook, he wrote the following quotation after oral administration of 86 micrograms of LSD. He said, my hand looks queer like a monstrous picture of a hand that writhes about until I fix it with a look. It has interesting contrast in its colors. I see it like an overreal picture, feel rather strange to it, as if it were someone else's. Everything in the room is rather unstable and methedrine has not abolished the effect on sensations. Now, this is significant because John Gadam was the first person to propose that the action of LSD was acting on the brain by antagonizing serotonin. Again, he was a pharmacologist and his experiences with LSD led him to propose in 1953, that same year, that the presence of serotonin in certain parts of the brain is consistent with the theory that LSD acts in the brain by antagonizing it. Now, this is very important because this was the first leap forward uh, in our understanding of the action of LSD and our understanding of serotonin's influence on behavior. And a year later, this led to a very important link between serotonin and mental illness. So two researchers from the Rockefeller Institute, Wayne Woolley and Elliot Shaw, published a paper in PNAS called The Biochemical and Pharmacologist Suggestion about certain mental disorders. And they said, Gadam was also cognizant of the mental effects of LSD and the occurrence of serotonin in the brain. We have surmised that he has been thinking, just as we have, about the relationship of serotonin to the mental disturbances induced by the drug. And they took this a step further. And they proposed that serotonin was probably playing a role in maintaining normal mental processes and that metabolically induced efficiency of serotonin may contribute to the production of some mental disorders. And so this was really the birth of the link between serotonin and mental illness. And to wrap up this part of the story, I just I pulled a, a really nice quote from Irvin Page, again, who was involved in the discovery of serotonin. Um, this was published in Science, and he, and he had a perspective piece on chemistry in the brain. And he said, the problem of the function, if any, of serotonin in the brain is far from solved. Its importance currently has been to provide, along with LSD, a nidus around which thinking about chemical reactions in the psyche revolve. It is such approaches as these that will, in my view, provide many keys to the solution of the problem of mental disease. Uh, and it did provide many of the keys to the solutions that we're still searching for. And so I'd like to now give uh, a second story, which I think also highlights the importance of psychedelics in our understanding uh, of another neurotransmission system, uh, the adrenaline system or epinephrine. And so this is related to the mescaline uh, compound. So around the same time these discoveries of serotonin were happening, 
uh, there was a search for an endogenous psychotogen in schizophrenia. And there was uh, a group of psychiatrists led by our old friend Humphrey Osmond, who also noticed uh, the importance of psychedelics in psychiatry. So Humphrey Osmond in the late 40s did a survey of the state of psychiatry and decided that the existing approaches weren't going anywhere. He said a new approach was needed, and if schizophrenia was primarily a disorder of perception, then drugs that alter perception uh, could potentially lead the way for a solution. And so he and his psychiatric colleague, John Smithies, uh, had taken mescaline, and it was the first time that they felt they finally understood what their patients were going through and the hallucinations that they were experiencing. And they saw them as vital tools to understand uh, these mental diseases. And so in 1952, they published a paper in the British Medical Journal, and they noted the structural similarities between mescaline and adrenaline, also known as epinephrine. And they said, after a brief survey of the present state of our knowledge regarding schizophrenia, we have drawn attention to the close biochemical relationship between adrenaline and mescaline. They said this taken in conjunction with the clinical relationship between acute mescaline intoxication and acute schizophrenia, and between the latter condition and stress appears to be us to us to be significant. And so they developed a hypothesis that perhaps uh, highly stressed states that were involved in schizophrenia could lead to altered metabolism of adrenaline epinephrine producing psychotomimetic metabolites. And so this developed into their search for an endogenous psychotogen that was a metabolite of adrenaline. And so in 1954, along with Abram Hoffer, they proposed that disturbances in adrenaline metabolism in schizophrenia could result in psychotomimetic metabolites. And so I've, I've put a, a graph over here on the right, and they focused in on, on numerous metabolites, but they highlighted one called adrenochrome, which they believed was psychotomimetic and, and was an oxidative product of adrenaline that could be produced uh, in schizophrenic patients. And so they said in this paper that adrenochrome, a derivative of adrenaline, has properties similar to those of mescaline and LSD and inducing psychosis-like states. As it probably occurs in the human body, it may be related to schizophrenia. And so this kind of made a large splash within the psychiatric community. And there was researchers over at the National Institute of Mental Health that wanted to test this hypothesis. And so in 1956, the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, Seymour Keady, had been tantalized by reports that abnormal oxidation products of epinephrine such as adrenochrome were uniquely concentrated in the urine of patients with schizophrenia. And so he recruited a man named Julius Axelrod, who was a pharmacologist, and he asked him to lead uh, a laboratory of clinical science and pharmacology to test these hypotheses so that they could better understand schizophrenia. And again, they sought to compare the metabolism of these catecholamines like adrenaline between patients with schizophrenia and healthy controls. And so to do this, um, this was actually revolutionary at the time, and very expensive, Seymour Keady was able to obtain radio labeled versions of norepinephrine and epinephrine. And so by putting a tritium label on these compounds, they could track their metabolism and they would be able to see if this adrenochrome hypothesis uh, was legitimate, uh, but it wasn't. So clinical testing that was led by Axelrod shows no evidence for the adrenaline hypothesis. So these clinical experiments showed no difference in catecholamine metabolism and no elevation of adrenochrome in schizophrenic patients. But something very interesting came out of it. So fortunately, even though the adrenochrome hypothesis was negative, uh, there was enough tritiated epinephrine and norepinephrine laying around for Axelrod to begin his groundbreaking experiments on neurotransmission. And Julius Axelrod eventually won the Nobel Prize using this tritiated epinephrine and norepinephrine. And in 1961, uh, using these compounds, he showed and published in a series of papers uh, that reuptake mechanisms were responsible for the inactivation of neurotransmitters. And eventually in 1970, he was awarded the Nobel Prize. And this was revolutionary because at the time, uh, we had no idea how neurotransmitters were properly handled and inactivated in the synapse. And so I just think this is a really cool thread and indirectly relates to psychedelics and their influence on our understanding. And so I'd like to conclude by saying that LSD and mescaline had a vital influence on the early discoveries of monoamine neurotransmission and that the remarkable effects of psychedelics really evolved our thinking about neurochemistry and the etiology of mental illness. And most importantly, it pulled us away from psychogenic models of mental illness and really helped to found biological psychiatry, which transformed the treatment of patients in our understanding of neuroscience. 
And I'd like to dedicate this talk um, to two of my heroes, Dr. Ed Domino and Dr. George Mishur. Uh, Dr. Ed Domino was a legend in the field of neuropharmacology. Um, he published over 900 papers uh, on many different psychoactive compounds, and he was a true hero to me and inspired me and, and supported me. Uh, he recently passed away in November, uh, and he was researching uh, very intensely uh, a lot of these things right up until he died. And I'd also like to thank Dr. George Mishur. Uh, he's been unconditionally supportive of me throughout my time in graduate school uh, in all aspects of life, uh, and I wouldn't be here without him. So I really appreciate uh, both of these people, and I will take any questions. Do we have any questions? No? Okay. Well, then let's thank Nick Denemy again. Representing the University of Michigan wonderfully. That was a fabulous history. Thank you. We, we talk about these things a lot and the origins get lost. So thank you for bringing that back to us. So next, we're going to welcome Robert Carbo from the Usona Institute, who will be talking to us about the synthesis and therapeutic potential of, hold on, I can say this, 5-MeO-DMT. Let's hear it for Robert. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'm really excited to come here and speak to you about the synthesis of 5-MeO. And I wanna talk to you from a different angle, just looking at the essence of why we are synthesizing this material. You know, as a synthetic organic chemist, a lot of the time when we speak of chemistry, a lot of people don't really want to pay attention. We talk about too much structures. <laughs> but I don't want to go in that direction. I, I, I want to go in a direction that really speaks as to the reason, rationale, as to why we do it. Or why I go in the lab every day and want to make stuff. Now, in regards to my consciousness, it doesn't stop because I wanna do synthetic organic chemistry. It's every time what I'm thinking about, what I'm doing, what I'm inspired to do. That is part of my whole being. It is not segmented into a very specific, just organic chemistry. And so why do I do what I'm doing personally? It means a lot to a lot of people that are willing to receive a therapy that we don't have a solution for in terms of bringing this therapy to those that need it. So when I go into the lab, that is part of my consciousness. That's part of my answers. That's part of who I am. And so that is why I just wanna give you an idea as to what are the potential that this molecule could be applied for. When I'll give you the evolution of the synthetic route, but not from a deep level chemistry perspective, but to give you the rationale as to how we are thinking about, you know, just thinking about the, the, the mechanism of the reactions and how we are inspired to carry out this synthesis. I will also look at the GMP synthesis and give you a future direction that we are going about bringing this to the general populace. First off, I just wanna talk a little bit about our mission. You know, the USONA Institute, this is why we do what we do. So we support preclinical and clinical research in order for us to further the understanding 
of the therapeutic effect of not only psilocybin, but also other consciousness expanding medication. Um, this is why I, we do what we do. We wanna elevate depression and anxiety in people for whom current medical treatment falls short in offering relief and a better quality of life. This is so vital to our mission. And from what our executive director have indicated here, he made a very nice quote. He saw this as something that will shape our future. And for me, that becomes very inspiring for something that is gonna um, shape our future. That means all of what we may have found from a scientific point of view, there is more to it. And so whenever I am stuck in the lab, I will always wanna expand my thinking, my perception that there is more to it. I just can't get stuck in the limited amount of information that I have. So we just wanna begin with nature from a naturalistic point of view, what have been observed. Now, a survey that was done recently, about 80% of respondents reported improvement in their symptom of anxiety and depression. Also in the naturalistic setting, symptoms related to post-traumatic stress disorder, alcohol misuse, misuse and traumatic brain injury have seen some indication that 5-MeO could, could be an effective therapeutic avenue to really relieve the difficulties that these, in the, these various patients might be undergoing. From a scientific point of view, we have seen evidences that 5-MeO modulates anti-inflammatory responses. This is really a big deal. There's a lot of illnesses out there that is associated with inflammation, you know, various pains, um, ulcers. There are so many things that are attached to anti-inflammatory responses. So if 5-MeO uh, has the ability to modulate that, that means more research into that could bring in a lot of therapeutic benefit. It is not only that, the ability for 5-MeO to inhibit neurodegeneration this is really very important. There are many um, disease processes that don't have cure. And all that is done is just to treat the symptoms of this disease. So the ability for 5 meo to modulate that, that is very significant. In terms of modulation also, we, we've seen that 5 meo also do mediate neuroplasticity in our talks, in the talks today that we've really witnessed, that people can get stuck in the perception box. So 5-MEO to have the ability to do that modulation um, will be very important. And then the last point, bullet point here to modulate proteins. There are many disease processes that are controlled by various types of proteins. In fact, we've seen gene expressions um, that is associated to psychosis or schizophrenia or depressions. So if we have 5-MeO with that ability to modulate those proteins, that will really open up the therapeutic landscape of disease processes that this molecule could address. So th these are reasons as to why we should synthesize 5-MeO. There is one more, if I may, um, bring up this aspect. What is the effect? How does this really occur? So we've seen that people who have taken this med medication have experienced you know, intense and dis distinct kind of features. There are no visual effects as some people may have really um, indicated. The ego dis dissolution and there's this famous quote like by, by Alexander Shurgin about the power of 5-MeO. Said, I did observe that once when I tried a small dose of 5-MeO 
when I was severely depressed, feeling to risk a big dose with the wrong mental set. Instead of sending me on a trip, it seemed it kicked me abruptly and permanently out of the depression and back to my normal state of mind. Something that has this ability, it's worth paying attention to. There are millions of people don't have, that don't have solution in terms of depression. In fact, the numbers, 20 million people, we are told, when you look at the number of people with mental illness worldwide, it's about a billion people worldwide with mental illness. For me, as a synthetic organic chemist, why will I stay in the lab and not do what I have to do with something that has this potential? Now, there are situations in which when we tried to synthesize the molecule, it does fail. It does, doesn't work. One more thing that I will say, why we need to synthesize this. The, the, the toad species that the 5-MeO is found in, there are a lot of issues that have arisen lately because they are really haunted and the habitant, habitat in which these toads are found is really decimated. And so there is this need for us as humans to really proactively help and intervene in situations that um, th these toads have been really harvested. We know in Southern California, uh, they are almost uh, extinct. And in some area, in some um, states there, they are categorized as endangered. So we need the synthetic material in order to give access to, to, in order to give access to this molecule. So we have an option as a synthetic organic chemist. If it doesn't work, we just try again and again until it works. Whereas the toad in their habitat may not have an option. Those that are waiting for this medication or cure may not have an option. It might be too late for some people. And so when I get into the lab, that is part of my consciousness. And so that is what I use, utilize and come up with the creative ways in order for us to synthesize the material. So the first time we tried it, this was a one route that we tried. I wouldn't go into, as I promised you, not to go into all the chemistry. But this is one route that we tried. We quickly realized that we are having difficulties with impurity. What is the option? We could just say, oh, let's stop trying. But we have an option. So we tried a different route. This was another route that we may have, we have tried in a previous synthesis. But we realized the impurities that really create, created problems in our prior route was also coming up in this synthetic route. So we had to go to a different synthetic path. And this is what we really ended up settled down with. It was a fischer indole reaction that we tried. And after optimizing it, we also were able to do it on a large scale. This is a, a CGMP scale up. And even though it's one synthetic route, what is essential is that every unit operation, it's so important that we maintain the highest form of quality. And so it is not about the number of steps, but the number of every unit operations. I've given here nine of them. That was not only the number of unit operations we had to go through, there were more to it. Now, by the time we get to 14, we then obtain the crude material. And so we needed to purify it again, and that was do recrystallization. It was recrystallized. By the time we were done with that, we had 19 unit operation. We were able to get 99.13% to 99.34% purity, highly pure material in spite of all of the challenges that we encountered in the synthesis. 
One aspect of what we do, we ensure that we are thorough in our synthetic evaluation. So it is not only about getting the material, but it's about also characterizing it to ensure that it has the form of the highest form of quality. And so we did a solid state characterization in which we look at the various polymorphs. There are times when the type of polymorph that you obtain may have a different pharmacological effect compared to a different polymorph. And so we wanna ensure that a single polymorph is obtained every time, short that when we administered this medication, everyone will receive the same type of polymorph. Another thing that we also ensured, we also looked at the solubility because we are doing IM intramuscular injection. We did not want it to precipitate. So we checked the solubility. As we could see here, the solubility is really high. The solubility of 5 meo 3 base is about less than 10 milligrams per meal. Here we are getting over 27 to 40 times the solubility. And so this was really impressive. The formulation that we will be using in our trials will just be USP saline because the material is highly soluble in water. And so this allows for a formulation that is really very conducive. That is what we've done so far in terms of chemistry. What have we done to ensure that our first in human trials meets all of the safety criteria? We have carried out a comprehensive pre and non-clinical studies. And I've just given here some idea as to the type of tests that we have done. Not only genotoxicity we've carried out, but we've also carried out safety pharmacology. We've also carried out the GFP studies. And so we are very pleased with what we've obtained so far. Now, there will be no way we will be able to do this on our own. We have collaborators that we've been working with, and one of them, Alex Quinn, in his talk today, he referred to um, the posters that we we presenting and also this particular discussion that I'm having right now. Um, Stephen Rehin, we are so pleased that um, they are part of our collaborators. And we also have Cody Wainthorn from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. And um, Christoph Koch, um, we are so pleased that they are part of our team. And we are highly, really um, highly uh, appreciative of all of the help we've gotten, not only from um, these partners, but some of our donors as well that um, I will not be able to go and list all of their names. So far, I've given you an idea as to why we are doing what we are doing. We've looked at the potential that 5-MeO holds in terms of bringing so much therapeutic value. And with time, we will begin to see some of this research, this fundamental research, get to this trans translational therapeutic level that we are all waiting for. I'm so pleased that my co-collaborators um, and partners are here. Um, I'm so also very happy that our executive director joined us to support us in this talk. And I'm very grateful that you showed up to uh, be a part of this discussion. Thank you. Are there any questions? We do have a question. Would you come up to the microphone if you have questions? We have uh, participants on Zoom that will only be able to hear you when you're speaking into the mic. Thank you, everyone. I'm just gonna hand it to you then. 
Uh, is 5-MeO DMT a Schedule One? Correct. Uh, what was the uh, approval process like uh, for you? Can you kind of paint a picture for us? Uh, do you have any? Uh, <clears throat> were you involved with with that process and making it through the uh, hoops and garters with the DEA? I, I, the reason I ask is uh, Rick Strassman has an entire chapter dedicated to that in his book, DMT, the Spirit, Spirit Molecule. And uh, it's a pretty comic. Um, yeah, it's nearly tragic, but of course he made it through and kind of paved the way for, for other researchers uh, with, with DMT to do the same thing, so. Thank you, excellent question. This, um, yes, it's schedule one. We, are faced with the challenge of the regulations that are still in place as a result of dealing with a Schedule One material. I would not just go into the lab and grab 5-MeO and do anything with it without the proper documentation. So all of those challenges, we, we are able to get through it by not giving up. What was in our mind, what was in our conscience was if we gave up, and those that will be benefiting from this, if they have the opportunity to ask us, why did you give up? Do we tell them that, yes, we just tried one or two times? So there were a lot of things that really have gone behind the scene to allow us to do this research. I may not be able to go expand on it in details, but know that it, was, it took a lot of tremendous amount of effort for us to be able to do this. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, I would love to be able to hear more from you afterward. I had a question about bufatine, and I was wondering if you had, um, if your group had looked at that at all or considered it. Uh, there's this kind of idea among the underground practitioners of smoking toad venom that bufatine has an anti-anxiety effect similar to how CBD is kind of a cohort in cannabis to THC. Now there's no science around that, um, but I was wondering uh, if your group had thought about also looking at that as well. Thank you, excellent question. Yes, it's one of the metabolites um, of the 5-MeO DMT. In fact, the CYP2D6 enzyme really um, breaks down 5-MeO to, to the bufotenin, which is an active metabolite. And we are looking at that very closely, especially in our non-clinical studies. But what we've found so far, we've not seen an increased level in the bufetonin, um, but we are still evaluating that. Obviously, we are paying very close attention to that. It is, um, it is one of those areas that um, we will obviously need to do more research um, into it in order to really see what, it's the, what that is really doing from a therapeutic level, you know. Yeah, we, we will be working, paying very close attention to it. Thank you. We have one more minute. Go ahead. Right. Um, this is just a jump off for her question. I was wondering, is, sorry if this sounds like a naive question, but is there a reason you choose 5-MeO as opposed to the other DMTs like, like HO, DMT, or something like that? Thanks. Thank you. Um, a lot of has been done with DMT um, already. Um, 5-MeO, we... Um, looked at what really will be that next molecule, you know, because we, we're dealing right now, we're in phase two clinical trials for, you know, major depressive disorder using psilocybin. So we look at the portfolio as to what is out there. And you, you've seen the evidence or, um, already, the indication how the therapeutic value 5-MeO will really has to offer if we are able to get through. So it was more of that therapeutic value that we are looking at that really inspired us to go for 5-MEO. Thank you very, thank you very much, Robert. Your passion for the field is inspiring. And it was pretty fascinating to see uh, the design process for those of us that are not familiar. Thank you. So uh, we have Haley Durong and 
She is coming to us from the Drug Use and Behavior Lab at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. The title is Towards a Broader Perspective of Psychedelics and Psychosis, Self and Tropic Broadening Theory. And uh, to further distill that, understanding the mechanism by which psychedelics create lasting change in people's lives. Thank you, Haley. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so, okay, there's the slide. So as we've heard um, the speaker so elegantly describe psych psychedelic induced states and psychosis have long been compared. Um, but when we sort of take a closer examination of how these states differ, and how they're similar, we might sort of arrive at a better understanding of what inspires um, changes in subjective experience that lead to either flourishing or languishing, or at least that's the idea. Um, so as a bit of a disclaimer, all models are wrong to some extent, but they may prove useful for inspiring further studies. So these are just some preliminary ideas I'm sort of throwing out there that might inform future research. So why have psychedelics been such a hot topic in recent years? Um, well, as many of the speakers have talked about today, they seem to display perhaps a transdiagnostic efficacy with everything from cocaine use disorder. This is the trial that I am involved with right now um, at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Um, being treated with psilocybin-assisted therapy, to things like demoralization in older AIDS survivors, to end-of-life distress. Um, so quite a wide array of potential applications. It might be that people are getting overly excited. The results are still needing clarification, but at least preliminarily, it seems like there's a great deal of potential. And also the second thing that sort of makes psychedelics especially interesting is their ability to elicit an enduring effect months or years later for a variety of different symptoms after one or two drug administration sessions in combination with therapy. So this is saying quite strongly that they could potentially tell us something significant about how to induce lasting change, positive change, and maybe perhaps what is at the heart of these very different um, conditions that people might experience. What is the sort of um, connective, uh, the overarching pathology in all of them? So psychedelics seem cool and all of that, but there's also a darker side that we oftentimes forget about. Um, Nick did talk about this quite a bit, but um, Humphrey Osmond did originally say that LSD's most innovative use sort of was to study psychosis from the inside to learn better methods of helping the sick. So the idea being that like a psychiatrist could take something like LSD and have better empathy for their patients. Um, obviously he revised um, this a bit later on with LSD becoming psychedelic, mind revealing, soul manifesting all of that. Um, but at least initially, this is what he thought it could be useful for. So quite a contrast to something that seems to have transdiagnostic efficacy. And moreover, it's not like this model has just this understanding that psychedelics or psychotomimics has disappeared. It has influenced some of the most prominent theories in psychedelic science, such as the entropic brain model, which compares psychedelics and psychosis based on their um, higher entropy in the brain. Um, and also even the first brain imaging study ever, um, or yeah, one of the first with um, psilocybin, this was a PET study in um, the 90s, was describing psilocybin as inducing a schizophrenia-like psychosis. Um, and other studies have reported that um, questionnaires that are meant to capture symptoms of psychosis um, during the acute effects of psychedelics are elevated. So that's the paradoxical psychological effects of lysergic acid diethylamide. That paper goes into that. Um, the LSC madness and healing that's looking at aberrant salience um, being increased under the influence of LSC. Um, all very interesting. 
And then um, in the early 50s, this was also obviously discussed. So it seems that even though this comparison really hasn't been the main focus of our research with all this exciting therapeutic um, studies going on, it seems to still be influencing our understanding of these compounds. So if there is a similarity as the um, lasting sort of influence, this understanding of, psych of psychedelics as psychotoma mimics suggest, um, why might they be similar aside from the obvious sort of perceptual changes that can occur? Um, well, psychedelics have been described as limiting the reducing vault of the brain to allow the mind at large to be experienced. Um, so that's what Huxley said sort of as a metaphor. And then um, quite similarly in parallel, psychosis has been described as an information overflow. Um, another way you could compare these states is psychedelics often perhaps due to people being so overwhelmed by the amount of information they're experiencing, um, not being able to put the experience in words well. So describing it as ineffable. In parallel, in psychosis, people often describe, or researchers describe the experience as incomprehensible. So that sense that it's so overwhelming, it can't easily be translated again. People have described people's thought processes under psychedelics as hyper-associative, so quickly and rapidly making connections um, that aren't necessarily that sound. Um, psychosis has been described as an over-inclusive thought process with a blurring of conceptual boundaries. So all of these kind of comparisons are suggesting that um, psych psychosis and psychedelics are both marked by this information overflow and sense of being overwhelmed and making novel connections sort of rapidly. Um, some people have sort of described the similarities based on what's called primary process cognition that has influenced some of the most sort of prominent theories in psychedelic science, such as the entropic brain model, but it's a psychoanalytic oriented term. So I don't know how much validity we want to put in that um, kind of construct, but it's at least suggesting at a phenomenological level that there is an overlap subjectively. <laughs> so how am I trying to sort of define perhaps how these states could be similar and the sort of pathway that um, leads to their similarities. So what I've, this is entropic processing. It's the idea that people experience in both states an increase in information richness. And when people are put into a state with an elevation of information, they often try to rapidly process that information in novel ways. That's a hyper associative form of thought. So, and this can lead to an altered salience of stimuli. So if you're trying to interpret something um, and all your mental schemas, your belief priors have been sort of broken and you're trying to kind of remap them out, things might seem sort of strange and you might not understand them in the typical way you would. This can lead to a sense of creativity and insight, but that sense of creativity might not actually be measurable, a measurable increase in creativity per se. It may just be that people are feeling more creative without actually being able to use that sort of um, chaotic, hyper-associative mind in a useful way. Um, so I think aberrant salience would fit into sort of the altered salience kind of component of that model. So this has been described as quite prominent in psychosis and what it is, according to the aberrant salience inventory, is an increase a sense of increased significance. People might report that they feel that their senses are sharpening. They might feel as if they're on the verge of understanding something big. And they often report heightened emotions in a sense that they're sort of at the peak of their cognition, that they're putting together ideas in novel ways and really sort of coming up with something new. Um, that sounds in a lot of ways quite like a psychedelic experience. Well, you would be right recently, um, they gave the aberrant salience inventory to people under the influence of LSD and scores were elevated. Um, so that's suggesting that there is this overlap there with these states. So on a more illustrative level, what might this look like? So these are two quotes. One person is having a psychedelic experience. One person is having a psycho 
is in the midst of the early phases of psychosis. One person said, eternity in a flower, infinity in four chair legs, and the absolute in the folds of a pair of flannel trousers. Second person said, my senses seemed alive. They hit me harder. Things appeared clear cut. I noticed things I had never noticed before. So who was having the psychotic experience and who is having the psychedelic experience? You, you know that you know the quote. <laughs> okay, well, 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 okay. Excellent job, fantastic. Good, good for you, you read the doors of perception maybe. Um, <laughs> so, but anyway, you, you see what I'm getting at. There seems to be this sense that the ordinary world becomes bizarre and everything seems more meaningful and interesting with both psychedelic induced states and early psychosis. And I think that sort of experience might be sort of why they were initially compared in the first place. So, and I wanna stress that this is the early phase of psychosis. I think it might become different once people have been sort of chronically medicated. I think that state might be very distinct. It might be more, um, well, people might have more prominent sort of negative symptoms. So I don't wanna make a comparison there, but I think at least in the early, sort of phases or the prodromal symptoms, this comparison might be able to be made. Um, and of course there's modern Huxley's out there too. You don't have to be a, um, yeah, a philosopher um, to kind of notice that the ordinary world looks strange under the influence of psychedelics. So I think this is a really meaningful um, component of the psychedelic experience that has been underappreciated <laughs> so I think that this sense that everything becomes, you're interpreting novel things from a different angle might sort of facilitate uh, therapeutic insights because you're also under psychedelics doing this to your own life to some extent. So now that I've illustrated how these states compare, at least phenomenologically, there are also neurobiological ways, but not gonna get into that with 20 minutes. Um, so how do they diverge? Because it's obvious with us throwing psychedelics at just about every um, mental illness out there and hoping that it works with good evidence um, that something is happening, something important. Um, so I think what we might need to do is kind of go beyond the ego dissolution model of psychedelics. I think that in the past people have sort of lumped these states together and their alterations in sense of self because both psychoanalysis, well, psychoanalysis have described ego, dis, ego dissolution as happening with both psychosis and psychedelic states. I think that this is a very narrow sort of model to understand what happens with the breakdown of the self. And I think if we sort of look at more recent understandings of what happens with the self in altered states, such as the work that's been recently done with psychosis, uh, we may arrive at a better, more nuanced understanding at what may might pave these very separate trajectories of experience. So what research has gone on in recent years with um, sort of the breakdown of the self in psychosis? Well, one very exciting sort of way to frame it is self disorder. So this has often been, well, schizophrenia actually means splitting of the eye. And I would almost describe this sort of neurophenomenological based research, the other Renaissance, it's just recently exploded so much in recent years. Um, and the self disorder sort of theory tries to unify the, the diverse symptoms of psychosis. It seems that throughout the illness, different presentations, a lot of times patients at first glance don't have similar symptoms, but when we look at it from the self disturbance model or self disorder model, it seems that they do. And also another exciting aspect of self disorder is it's able to distinguish in the early phases of psychosis when patients often appear very similar to those with depression or anxiety, um, that this person might actually become psychotic. So you're not able to do that oftentimes just based on positive and negative symptoms alone. So that's saying that this um, <clears throat> breakdown of the self might be, or disordered sort of self is key to predicting the trajectory with this illness. Um, and in further support of the importance of the self-disturbance, self-disorder model, um, people have also found it is predictive 
of functioning and long-term outcomes. So social functioning, self-esteem, people's odds of experiencing remission, and most direly, um, if somebody commits suicide. Whereas if somebody is having more self um, disorder, they're more likely to have um, to kill themselves. So it's very, it seems to be very important that we pay attention to whatever this is um, getting at. So what exactly is the self disorder model? What is it like to experience? What is its key components? Um, so also I should have said that it's um, sort of put, the initial model was put forth by Lewis Sass um, in his book, Madness and Modernism, really does a very detailed job of outlining what this theory is all about. <laughs> but anyway, so one component is reduced self-presence. So what is this like to experience? Um, one psychosis patient said, everything seems distant as if it is behind plate, plate glass. So feeling very cut off in the world. Another said, I am not a part of this world. I am almost non-existent. So it's feeling as if you're not really fully there. You're not really fully present as the name implies. Um, so it's as if your experience isn't taking up all of your conscious awareness in a sense is how I've also heard it phrased. Um, this contrasts very strongly with what I think might be an underappreciated aspect of alterations in self-experience with psychedelics, namely that they may in increase self-presence. So this is from um, Ram Dass describing his first experience with psilocybin. And he says, I was just presence unfeathered by the usual slipstream of random thoughts, images, and sensations. I nestled into this sense of pure being, feeling my way into this timeless inner self that was independent of outer identity. So that's not being non-existent in the world, as this quote suggests somebody with psychosis um, experiences. It's almost as if they're more fully there, more present. It's a very under, I don't think it's very formally studied with psychedelics, but I think that we should look into this aspect of experience further. Another part of the self-disturbance model or self-disorder model is hyperreflexivity. So what is this? This is an excessive self-consciousness of one's inner experience. So what this really means is instead of just experiencing what you're experiencing, you're trying to self-referentially like notice your own thoughts. So this is describing a patient in early psychosis and he was trying to listen to some music and he just didn't like it. And he realized the reason he didn't like it was he was internally watching his own receptivity to the music, his receiving or registering musical tunes. He, so to speak, witnessed his own sensory processes rather than living them. In some ways, one could describe this as sort of the antithesis of mindfulness. This contrast very strongly with some experiences people have reported with psychedelics. So this is from Michael Pollan's famous book, How to Change Your Mind, and during his first psilocybin experience. And he said, I became a transparent ear, indistinguishable from the stream of sound that flooded my consciousness until there was nothing else in it, not even a, a dry, tiny corner in which to plant an eye and observe. So instead of trying to observe your sensory experiences from this very self-focused -fo perspective, it's as if the information available um, to somebody in the psychedelic induced state um, <clears throat> induces a loss of sort of self-focus and you just become fully present, fully there. Um, so this is a reduction of self-focus is how I would describe it due to increases in information richness perhaps. Um, whereas the experience with somebody with psychosis is more information rich than typical, more of an entropic processing style. So somebody with psychosis, they might be walking down the street and they might think people are talking about them, thinking about them and saying things about them. And yeah, that's not actually happening, but it's a more rich experience than an ordinary person might have. It's more entro uh, an entropic processing style, but the difference is that it's sort of weighted down by this self-focus where everything in the world is somehow conspiring to be about them. So that sort of cuts people off from interacting with others perhaps. 
And there are basic sort of cognitive tasks that get at this tendency too. like people will be um, <clears throat> more likely to think in averted eye gazes, um, looking at them um, and other things too that I don't have a slide for, but <laughs> um, so I really think we should more thoroughly examine the alterations in self experience with psychedelics. I think a lot of our key ways of understanding the psychedelic experience are arriving at this conclusion that reductions in self-focus seem to be key. So ego dissolution, of course, that oceanic boundlessness, mystical experiences. Uh, so that's the idea of having an information-rich experience and having a small self. Um, it's a less talked about sort of mechanism, but I think it's just as important. So all of these if we condense them down to sort of one major idea, I say we could probably put it as self-focus. So, um, and there's also a lot of evidence that this reduction in self-focus seems to predict lasting clinical outcomes. So for treatment resistant depression, alcohol use disorder, smoking cessation and ceremonial use with um, uh, healthy volunteers in other settings. So like a psilocybin assisted retreat, and people who are healthy, who are looking to further their spiritual practices. All of these studies have found that either the MEQ, um, so that's a mystical experience questionnaire, or ego dissolution inventory seem to be key for predicting outcomes. So again, suggesting that this alteration in self-experience is in some way sort of essential for predicting the trajectory. Um, so why might this be? Or maybe to further illustrate this. Um, so somebody who is depressed, what they said when they would look, this is looking at an orchid. They said, I would look at orchids and intellectually understand there was beauty, but not experience it. So it's a less sort of information rich uh, version of the world. Everything is sort of flat and pixelated almost metaphorically, of course. Um, but after, well, during psychedelics, everything becomes quite, vivid, quite extreme, quite a um, information rich style of processing. And people get so absorbed in that, that they reduce their sense of self perhaps. Um, and afterwards, I think this sort of, there's a residual effect where that reduction in self-focus and more sort of information rich style of processing remains, but to a lesser, more controllable extent. So this uh, patient, said after their psilocybin assisted therapy, a veil dropped from my eyes. Things were suddenly clear, glowing, bright. I looked at plants and felt their beauty. I can still look at my orchids and experience that. That is one thing that has really lasted. So I think this is suggesting it's critical, yeah, that we look at sort of the trajectory of how this sort of change in perception and way of experiencing the world occurs. So yeah, it's seeing the fuller picture if, you're struggling with alcoholism, say, and you go to a beach, you might just be thinking, oh, there's alcohol. It's a very uh, narrow sort of view of the world. But somebody who's had psilocybin assisted therapy, theoretically, they might get sort of a broader perspective of the world, a more information rich version where they can go to the beach and think, oh, there is alcohol there. You can go drink, but there's also a whole beach. Wow, cool. Um, not enough time to get into the details of that, um, but some caveats and considerations. Yes, people do have quite spirit, strong spiritual experiences with psychosis, but oftentimes these sort of take the form of religious delusions. So people may report a sense of being chosen by God or belief one is a religious figure. Um, these can be experienced quite positively at first. One person said, the next day, this is during a psychotic break, the next day was horror and ecstasy. I began to feel that I might be the agent of a, some spiritual awakening. So that's sort of very different than a mystical type experience typically is. Um, and a challenging experience um, obviously can occur with psychedelics, and there definitely can be an element of paranoia with that, which obviously is a form of self-focus, but I think this might be more likely to incur in environments where people feel insecure and not safe. And this could be likely mitigated. And it is regularly the least endorsed factor in controlled research. Um, so the mechanism sort of I have described where psychedelics induce an entropic processing style 
coupled with a reduction in self-focus and perhaps an increase in self-presence. I don't think this is necessarily a distinct mechanism. I think something could, similar, or it corresponds with aspects of mindfulness, the overview effect, awe, um, in a more general sense. But I think that classic psychedelics may be distinct in the consistency and magnitude of this effect. Um, so that's why they're especially interesting. That's kind of an outline of the general trajectory of entropic processing and high self-focus overall leading to a more sort of negative experience potentially as exemplified by psychosis. So, um, so another thing you might wanna think about is that there are other substances out there that might seem more psychotomimemic than other um, than what we are describing as a psychotomimemic. So delirium substances are very, very understudied class. Um, these can induce auditory verbal hallucinations, delusions, cognitive impairments, potentially alterations in self-experience that even uh, naturalistic users, as you can see from the meme, regularly describe as psychosis-like. So I think we need to kind of re-examine this question of what drugs are psychotomimemics and why we're calling that them that um, to better understand um, the trajectories of various um, extreme states and what that can teach us about how to um, facilitate well-being and prevent adverse outcomes. And I think it's important that we, even if SIEB has issues, um, that we at least consider the overlap and the differences between psychedelic states and psychosis more, because this is a question that has really been neglected by psychedelic science for a long time, but I think potentially has huge implications of the field, which is still very young. But if we want to build a strong foundation going forward, this paradox must be answered, I think, of a substance being both inducing a psychotic like state, but paradoxically being healing. So thank you everybody for listening to that. Um, I would like to thank my advisor, Peter Hendricks for helping me with some of these ideas. Um, Co-author on one of my, the paper that's describing this, um, it's eventually going to be out Camilla Strauss um, and Jessica Turner, who was my honors thesis advisor back in undergrad, who also helped me develop these ideas. If you have any questions, yeah, you can email me there too. <laughs> Thank you, Haley. You have any questions? Thanks so much. That was a great talk. So I'm thinking about um, these experiences, uh, mystical experiences being characterized by things like ineffability mm -hmm. and uh, noetic quality, right? And so to me, I've seen this like paradox that you're describing here where instead of egos being lost mm -hmm. because people have this experience that feels like they're exposed to the subjective truth and they can't describe it, they actually have like this sort of inflated sense of ego to tell people what is the nature of reality after using psychedelics. And so I guess I just wondered if you came across that at all in this thinking about not only the relationships between um, psychedelics and psychosis, but also like potentially the gateway between them. Um, so yeah, just thinking about that, that capacity of psychedelics to increase self-focus in a way that becomes sort of uh, ego inflation. I think that can happen. And I think that is a very understudied area. I think there might be somewhat of a U-curve sort of relationship going on where perhaps people exposed to um, psychedelics repeatedly might kind of go to the fringes of their ideas and conclusions that they have arrived at and develop their own sort of novel ideas and think they're right, think they have access to some special spiritual knowledge, think they're a guru, whatever. And I think you can see this happen with um, things like meditation and yoga training and all sorts of things that might at first glance reduce self-focus. Um, but the issue with really thoroughly digging into that is unfortunately, to my knowledge, there have not been any sort of studies see, looking at um, psychedelics increasing that sort of narcissistic quality, which I think could definitely be a thing. And I think could be one of the real potential risk of using psychedelics, but there's no data yet there. So that's something I hope to dig into. 
Thank you very much, Haley. That was very refreshing, engaging, and humorous, and very accessible. Thank you. So our next two presentations are going to come to us from the University of Liege. The first one will be on Zoom, and then our final presentation will again be in person. Just uh, that, that will also be on Zoom. I, I don't know if you guys can hear me, but that, that will... The, the 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 last presentation is 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 also is me, which is also on uh, on oh, Zoom. Oh, very good. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you for the information. We are going to have That's two. That's okay. No problem. From Paolo Cardone, and the first one is going to talk about the use of psychedelics to treat disorders of consciousness, a protocol for a randomized clinical trial with ketamine. Welcome, Paolo. Hello, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very okay. clearly. Okay, good. So I'm gonna just start to share my screen. So I suppose you should be able to, to see the slides, right? So, um, well, first of all, let, let me thank you all for, for this opportunity. And with the co-authors, some of them are actually either there in uh, in in Tucson and here in uh, Liège, but uh, contributing through through Zoom. And so, what I want to talk to you about it's uh, my part of my PhD project that is entitled "Complexity in Anti Drugs to Treat Disorders of Consciousness," and we are specifically focused on the study of ketamine. So, as you all know, we are all interested in consciousness, but there is a, a very clear clinical representation of what consciousness is. And the way it, this taxonomy of consciousness works is through three different axes. The first one is the wakefulness, which is just basically the level of arousal that you have, awareness, which is a more richness of the content that you experience, and your lately understanding that another important way to, to, to define a conscious state is connectedness, which is basically the, the idea of being able to, to the, interact with the external world. One example is, for example, the, what, you, what would you experience in, in REM sleep where you're having a, a phenomenological state without uh, being able to, to interact with the world in such a way that a person from outside would, uh, would say that you are not conscious even if, uh, if you actually are. And so as Dr. Uh, as Dr. Martial already presented you uh, today, the three of them are mostly um, correlated in such a way that when, when one is high, the others are high as well, unless actually we experience a brain damage. And uh, I'm specifically gonna focus on disorder of consciousness. And uh, this is something that you have already probably heard about by uh, Professor uh, Monti in, 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 in the previous days. But uh, I just want you to go back to that. So after a, a very severe brain damage, patient my, my undergo is a state of coma. So coma is a transient state where there is no wakefulness or eye, eyes are closed and the only behavior that are shown are reflexive behavior. So now some of these patients actually wake up from that. So they open their eyes at the enter a state that is called a responsiveness wakefulness syndrome. Now, this is a state that was, that was previously known as vegetative state. But now we are trying to use this more descriptive way uh, to uh, to define it because it just of unconsciousness where people have eyes opening, they have a good uh, uh, sleep-wake cycle, but again, the behavior they show is a reflex behavior. Some of these unconscious patients actually eventually show some, uh, some sign of consciousness and they enter what is called the minimally conscious state where there are behavior that are goal directed. This can be, for example, a visual pursuit where they track you in, uh, in, uh, in the room or something like a, a response to command. Now, if they're able to, to, to reproduce a command following in, in, a, in, in a systematic way, so meaning that they can perform the, the action that you, you ask them all the time, or the, if they're able to, to functionally use objects around them, 
they exit this state in, and they go in uh, the state that's called the emergence from a minimally conscious state. And this is not anymore the disorder of consciousness because they're now able to, to be fully functional. And even if, even if there might be some impairments yet. So now this is what we see in the clinics, right? And uh, this clinical examination is just a synonym basically with behavioral examination. And uh, there's already been some discussion about uh, what are the limits of this behavioral assessment. And one of them is that from one side, from the clinical point of view, we need clinicians to have an extensive training to understand which signs are the, the very important one. We need to have the, a lot of time to repeat assessment uh, to have a, an accurate diagnosis. And uh, unfortunately, there might be even individual biases into the single clinician when, uh, when going to, to assess the patient. And from the patient side, there are a plethora basically of, of problems that, that can happen. So here I've listed a few, but uh, the main concept is that there might be sensory problems. So the person is not able to perceive it, not even the, the command when we ask them. Problems regarding the, the motor output or, or problems that are more connected with, with the medical condition of the patient. Like for example, think of a patient that are sedated and then might not be able to display any behavior. And of course, there might be even the, the, the scenario that the patient just did not cooperate with, uh, with, the, with the clinician at the bedside. So what we are really, really looking is, uh, is a way to, to, to overcome the problems with all these people assessment. And uh, you already have heard of that, but uh, there is one property of the brain that is actually pretty good in, in, in for, for diagnostic value, which is complexity. So um, complexity is very peculiar because it, it's come from a, from a completely different domain, mostly from physics. The easiest way to, to, to see it, it's pro, I think with like uh, with graphs where you have uh, basically um, some nodes which are connected with edges. And so what you can see is that um, complexity, it's really the degree of, of the combination of integration and differentiation of, of a system. So in the first column, what you would see is that, for example, you have a graph that is all interconnected in such a way that if you stimulate the node, what would you have? It's a stereotypical uh, activity throughout all the graph. And you can see here that there's, there's actually one huge wave at the end. Uh, if instead of you, you're looking at the system that is, uh, that is uh, um, connected just locally, you would see that the activity is different depending on of the, of the node that you, um, that you stimulate, but it, it stays just uh, local under the, the simulation, it doesn't broadcast. But instead, if you have a system with like differentiated um, connection between, between nodes and strength, what well, you see is that after a simulation of a node, you have a specific and peculiar pattern in space that would result as well in a differentiated activity over time. And so this is exactly what happens for, you know, what it's thought to happen in, in the conscious states and um, that are very complex in, in time and space. So this is, of course, it's interesting, but it's just like a representation and we are not graphs. And uh, so let, when, when we look at the humans, so we, we have a, a way to just like something very similar, which is through transcranial magnetic stimulation and the electroencephalography, which is, we can be called with MSCG. And so what, what you basically do is you record the brain activity through the EEG, you perturb the brain with a pulse through a, an electromagnetic like a coil, so basically just a coil where you make electricity pass really, really fast. And the, you know exactly where you are driving in the past because you can have an online modeling of, of, the, of the head through a neural navigation. So what you, would, you can see is exactly the response of, uh, of the brain of, to your simulation. And if you, if you see like this, this is basically what uh, was before in the, in the last row, the activity that happens through, through time and, uh, and space. And so it really, it really changes over a conscious state. And uh, like, for example, let's imagine that now you, you take a coil and you simulate like my prefrontal cortex right now what you would you see is an activity that actually it's very differentiated over time. It propagates on front of the cortex and then in, in, on, uh, on the back. 
and it's very long lasting, meaning that the, it, it, is, it is in this case long up to 300 milliseconds. So let's think instead that, that, that now I finish talking and uh, I, I go to sleep here in, uh, in, uh, it's in the Europe, it's uh, 3 a.m. and you simulate me in the same exact uh, spot when I'm asleep and I'm not dreaming. Well, what you see is activity that's completely different that will stay locally under the coil and that doesn't propagate in a region and it stops basically after 150 milliseconds. So it's way shorter. So what I'm trying to, to say here is that uh, this, this activity of conscious states is way more complex, but like, uh, of course, in sense, we needed to quantify things. And the, here it is where there, there are different measures that, that, uh, that come in place. And uh, one of the coolest one thing is the perturbation and complexity index of a PCI, where you basically perturb the brain, as I, should, as I told you, you record the brain activity and brain response, and you try to compress it. It's like a zipping process. And so what, what, what you can do is you can really separate conscious uh, subject and unconscious one. I want to give you like a representation of that. And this is basically the value of PCI of different subjects. And you can see that are pretty high. Um, and then if you take a subject and then you put, you, you have a for, for each column here is, is one subject, right? And you, for example, if you take one subject and, and you put them uh, asleep or you, or you give them an aesthetic, we'll see a very strong decrease of complexity in such a way that actually you can draw a line in here and separate really the, the person that are, that, are, that are conscious to the one that are not conscious. Now, let's imagine that we have tried to apply this to the patient who was talking to you before. Uh, so what would you see is that like uh, the patients that show behaviorally sense of consciousness have pretty high complexity, which is it's similar to, the, to, uh, to one that we would we expect for a conscious patient, right? While when we look at the patients that are in a responsive wakefulness syndrome and a vegetative state, the scenario is a little bit more complex. Like there are some patients that display um, basically no response and, this, and no complexity, and this may be because of uh, uh, very big cortical damage. Patients that could uh, show sure response that is stereotypical and low in complexity, and here you can see that is similar to the to the one of uh, the sleeping Paolo. And finally, there would be patients who show pretty high complexity, even if they do not respond to anything. So here, the, the, it's intriguing because these patients are, uh, if, if I remember correctly in this paper, I think that out of, of these uh, nine patients, I think that six or, uh, of them actually recovered uh, quite uh, in, the, in, the, in the following weeks. So the idea are, are twofold. Or, so either this patient is already conscious, but it's like a, a disconnected case where we, we, we don't see basically the, the um, the behavior responses, even if he's conscious, or it's actually a complexity, it's just a step before the emergence of, of a conscious behavior. And this really begs the question about what's the real link between uh, complexity and unconsciousness and, and whether actually complexity can cause consciousness. If that was the case, and if we could actually increase complexity in this patient, we might have a new, new conscious behavior. But the truth is that we never knew how to, to do that um, until the recent findings that showed that psychedelics do exactly that. So they, you already have seen this in the, in the, in the, in the, in the previous talks, but uh, just, just to repeat that, they really increase complexity in the brain. And you can see that throughout the different techniques. This is, uh, for example, in, in uh, MEG, and this is actually like the work in, in fMRI uh, on harmonics. Um, I think that the, uh, Dr. Carton Harris has already uh, pointed a little uh, bit out of that. So what you see is that really psychedelics and in this case ketamine can increase complexity. So the aim of the project is really to, to use this property for, uh, for, for our patient and to use psychedelic as a treatment to, to ameliorate conscious state in patients with disorder of consciousness. This is an idea that, of course, was brought like, at the very first from by Scott and the Cartoners, and we really want to, to test that. 
And then on top of that, we want to look for, for baseline biomarkers because they, we imagine that if this works, it might not work for all the patients. And so we want to know if there are some characteristics that can predict responsiveness to, to, to the drug. So we want to do that. I'm sorry, I'll uh, be further going to that. Like some of you may ask why we're looking at ketamine. And uh, actually, this might not be a very huge uh, surprise for, for uh, most of you because, like, you all know that. Uh, that it's used for, as an anesthetic agent because you know, it's, a, it's an MDA antagonist, so it's not even a, a classic psychedelic. But uh, the interesting thing is that there are psychedelic effects in uh, subanesthetic doses. And um, actually, the, this is very interesting. Uh, people where they show that probably even the anesthetic one, what we see, it's, uh, it's like uh, the personalization or detachment rather, rather than, uh, than the complete unconsciousness. And, um, so one of the reasons why we're looking at, at this is because of course it's uh, we are we're pretty sure to switch to high complexity state um, with uh, with the dose that we are aiming at uh, and uh, this is a substance that's already used quite widely in in the clinical setting and this is relevant because like if we want to to to, to make a psychedelics enter into um, into really the, the clinical practice, we needed to, to have something that's really in place. So what we want to do, it's it's actually um, to, to to use a uh, to use a protocol that is divided in three phases. The first one is an observational phase where patients undergo a multimodal assessment through EEG, fMRI, PET, that is for the metabolism and behavior, and then they enter in our experimental phase where we see them uh, two times. What we do basically is we record the TMSCG activity of the brain, and after 20 minutes of that, we start delivering and giving the, the drug uh, ketamine up to, uh, to a substance aesthetic uh, dose. And we keep the, 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 this for 90 minutes. What we do is we re repeat the behavior assessment every 30 minutes. Uh, five days apart, we do the same thing basically, and of course, like we. we uh, we just changed the, the, the substance that we gave. That is to say that in one case it will be ketamine, in the other it will be placebo. Uh, we, will, we will control for carryover effects the next day of, of each session. Um, of course, once the experimental phase is over, we are not forgetting about the patient, we will follow up them for, for up to two years to check if everything is fine, if they, if they actually recover afterwards, and this might be interesting for some interpretation afterwards. We can discuss uh, some additional information that might be, that might be good for, to, to know are that we are, we are looking for, a, we are gonna uh, recruit 30 patients stratified by diagnosis, like uh, in our response, we have syndrome that are completely unconscious, MCS who are show sense of consciousness, and that ketamine will not be given as a bolus, but the, through a target control infusion, it's a continuous infusion so that we are really sure about the concentration that there is in the blood. What we expect in our hypothesis is that basically like complexity should be proportional to the concentration of ketamine. And again, so there would be that if that we go into a high, high complexity state um, as a function of increasing the, 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 the ketamine concentration uh, in this patient, we expect to see new sense of consciousness after we reach a level of subanesthetic dose of ketamine. And of course, we, we provided that there might be patients that show uh, higher complexity or new sense of consciousness that we consider responders. We, will, we expect to see actually differences between, between uh, baseline uh, neurophysiology, so the baseline EGF MRI, between this patient and the patient that did not respond at all yeah, to our protocol. So for, for the expected results, I, want, I really want to, to, to think about those in, in uh, separating complexity and consciousness. And here, as you can see, I'm not, I'm not considering detrimental effects, but it's something that, uh, that we can discuss as well. So if we see an increased complexity with new sense of consciousness, well, that's amazing. This, we, we may have finally uh, found a new treatment for a really unmet uh, clinical, um, clinical need. But if we, if we see new sense of consciousness, but complexity does not increase, this might suggest that these two are actually two independent phenomena. And uh, this might be 
uh, very interesting uh, from a scientific point of view. If we see that there, there are no novel sense of consciousness of increase and increased complexity, we could see again an, uh, like a, a proof of uh, two phenomena that are, that are independent, or we could actually see something that of uh, a case of disconnected consciousness. So again, like a scenario where we actually, the patient is there, but cannot just display anything. Um, and while instead, if, if, if we see that there is the same level of complexity, but, and so no increase in complexity, no sense of, uh, of consciousness, new ones, well, this might suggest that actually psychedelic, in order to increase complexity, already need a complex system. And this is something that, uh, that uh, uh, Naji and I are currently thinking of and we are drafting uh, uh, an opinion paper about uh, this, this, this concept. So where we at, uh, we got the approval from the ethical committee. Finally, we, our first pilot will be May. So I was hoping to, to show you already some results, but unfortunately that was not possible, but, we'll, but we hope to have that uh, by the end of, um, in summer, basically. So this is a, this is just a quick summary to show you that we uh, we we are a patient with uh, disorder of consciousness and low brain complexity, and we expect that after ketamine, we we'll see higher complexity and a new sense of consciousness. What I hope you take home from all of this is that you are, are a little bit more convinced that complexity and consciousness are, are linked. Maybe they are the same thing, and the complexity it's, it's pretty low in in this patient. And uh, we now know that psychedelics, including those or the ketamine, increase complexity in a healthy participant. And thus we can use uh, psychedelic, in this case, ketamine again, as a treatment for DOC. So I want to, to thank, of course, all the, all the patients and the families for their support, because otherwise this would not be possible. All the funding agency and the, the friends of the, of the Psychedelic Society of Belgium, and all of you for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Paolo. Are there any questions before the second presentation begins? We do have a, several questions, Paolo. Okay. Let us know nice. for sure if you can hear them. They'll speak into the microphone for you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can. Question, um, I know a lot of ketamine protocols for uh, treatment for mental health require four to six sessions of infusions within a, like a two to three week time span. And I'm just wondering why that is. Um, so uh, first of all, is this, uh, you're talking here about uh, uh, psychiatric disorder, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. So um, I would say that this really goes to more into discussion that of, of the presenter just uh, before me. And uh, probably this has to do with the change of, of uh, phenomenology that, uh, that uh, uh, requires more work than just one session, right? Um, what we're looking here is instead a, a neurologic disorder. So we, what we expect it's actually a, an acute phase that if the mechanism of complexity and, and consciousness are, are really tight as, as we might think they are, we should see an acute effect uh, uh, already with just one, uh, uh, one, uh, one session. This, this, this is to say, and I want to be clear on that, that the expectation is that uh, there, this, this is not long lasting. Um, and we have already good, good um, treatment, I'm not sorry, we, we have a good example of, of, for example, treatment that are used for, for acute, uh, for, for acute uh, use, uh, like for example, Zalpidam, as shown that uh, when some patient, when you give them, the patient might just wake up for four or five hours and that's, uh, uh, that's, that's really uh, peculiar. And we expect something that's similar to this. So I'm not, I'm not sure whether I was clear with, uh, with my point on whether, why we don't need, or why we don't think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's so uh, crucial to have more than one session. Uh, fine, thank you. Thank you, Paolo. We have another question. Um, I, I'm really an outsider to this kind of research, so I'll mm -hmm. apologize up front that if this is a very naive question, but I noticed you've stratified your patients by their status right now, yeah. but I'm imagining that there's heterogeneity in how they got there, what their mm -hmm. past neurological history is, mm -hmm. the time course, the nature of the injury, et cetera. 
And I'm wondering if there could be biological heterogeneity that is going to impact the response to ketamine that is not captured by these two discrete um, categories that you've divided them into. And I'm wondering if that's gonna be part of your post hoc analysis. Um, so this is a very crucial point and uh, thank you for very much for the question. Um, this goes back to, the, to, to what I was saying before on one side about uh, <clears throat> this idea if whether we take a delk need an already complex system. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna be a little bit brief on that, but this is exactly what like uh, some of the work of Naji will, will uh, um, take place. That is basically to, to, to model the, the activity of, of, the, uh, of the brain of this patient, because uh, there might be some, some differences at the baseline that can predict specifically yeah, what, what kind of response um, we have. And uh, this may be, as, as you were saying, um, this can capture the heterogeneity in basically clusters. So there are some, this, uh, some category of patients that, uh, that do respond pretty well and others that do not. Um, regarding other issues with heterogeneity of patient, that's very much an issue. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure we, we, we can take that into account in a, in a very detailed way. Uh, I'm happy to discuss that in uh, afterwards. I would just want to say, for example, that that, that uh, um, there's a, a different stratification of, for example, an oxid patient and TBI patient, where TBI most of the time have a better uh, uh, recovery, whereas TBI, sorry, it's traumatic brain injury. For, so, for example, current uh, accident. So it might be likely that uh, most of the TBI patients are, for example, in uh, MCS, which is patient, uh, patient that shows sense of consciousness. And uh, so as you can see, there, there, are, there may be some uh, demographic uh, issues or, or histology issue that they can enter in place in the stratification itself that can confound basically uh, the, um, the observation. On, on top of that, I actually wanted to just to say that this is pretty critical problem with, with our patients because there is a, by nature a very big heterogeneity of damage even within the same category. But we will look at just at patients that are, that are stable and uh, we'll try to be as chronic as possible in, uh, in such a way that um, like we know that for example, if a patient that's been for 10 years in a, in a, in a vegetative state, we know that if, if we see some sign, it's not because of a natural evolution, but uh, your point is absolutely, uh, absolutely correct. Um, that's that's like, yeah. It's very exciting research, and I look forward to hearing the results at some point in the future. Thank you. Paolo, thank you for this painstaking, fastidious, detailed research. We really appreciated it. Thank you very much. Very well received. Thank you. Our last presentation of the evening is uh, Naji, can you say your last name for me? How do you pronounce it? Yes, it's just Alnagar, not not too uh, not too unexpected. Alnagar. So we have That's Naji right. Alnagar coming to us also from the University of Liege, and he's going to speak to us on the unique disruption of information of information processing induced via propofol, ketamine, and dex meditomidine. Thank you very much, Najee. Okay, yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, Dexmedotimidine is, is a very hard word to say. I often trip up over it myself. Um, so, yeah, happy to be here. I'm going to talk uh, actually not so much about psychedelics directly, although, of course, as Paolo mentioned, it is things that we are uh, involved in and actively looking at. Um, but today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the work we've been doing in uh, deep sedation and anesthesia, particularly induced through uh, propofol, ketamine and uh, dexmedotimidine. Uh, so the first point to make is that uh, consciousness is an integrative process. And uh, we've heard this a lot throughout the conference already, and I'm sure we'll continue to hear the point and it's this idea of well you know when you see an object you don't experience the object's color and its shape as separate entities from the object itself they're 
the 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 the, the features are unified to give you a a, a, a entire percept of, of that uh, object. So integration is important um, conceptually when thinking about consciousness, and it's probably also very important in the brain. And uh, a number of key uh, leading theories of consciousness works in the brain um, say that, that, that this integration is absolutely central. We have, for example, the integrated information theory uh, by, uh, formulated by Giulio Tononi uh, that says, well, the amount of information that's integrated by a system is then directly associated with how conscious that system is. And of course, that relates a lot to the whole complexity story that we've heard so much about um, so far. But also you've got the global neuronal workspace theory, and this is an, the other sort of uh, main uh, neuroscientific theory of consciousness that says, well, in order for information to be consciously accessible, it must be integrated before then being broadcast to a number of higher order uh, cognitive st uh, systems in the brain. And only then are you conscious of the information. So. Integration is really important for these, both of these theories, but the way in which it's implicated is different. And what we can do with brain imaging research is we can look at sort of how do these uh, changes in integration uh, occur and what underlies these uh, uh, um, integration of information in the brain. And uh, one of the main tools to do this, of course, is a big reason of why we're all interested, is looking at altered states of consciousness and how information processing changes in those. So with that in mind, uh, what we're looking at here is uh, anesthesia and deep sedation through three uh, anesthetic agents. Uh, the first one is propofol. Uh, which is a, a general anesthetic used in a, uh, the clinical setting. Um, it's uh, a GABA-A receptor agonist, and it has a number of other um, GABA-type uh, um, effects. Uh, this, this results in a direct inhibitory effect. Whereas we're also looking at ketamine, which of course we, we know a little bit about. It has uh, indirect sort of inhibitory effects through its an MDA receptor antagonism. And uh, phenomenologically, of course, it doesn't result in unconsciousness as such. I mean, it rather results in a disconnection. Um, and even at high doses, you, see, you have these uh, reported experiences um, uh, during the, the deep sedation induced by ketamine. And then lastly, we're looking at this drug called dexmedotimidine, which is a adrenergic A2 receptor agonist, again, having indirect inhibitory effects. And phenomenologically induces a state which is similar to NREM sleep. Um, and also actually, um, interestingly, um, dreamlike reports are uh, associated with the uh, sedation induced by dexmed. So, the idea then is that similarities and differences in these states uh, induced by these drugs might reveal sort of uh, unitary characteristics of uh, sedation and, and perhaps even low conscious states in general, and maybe even consciousness uh, more generally than that. So importantly here, what uh, I'm going to present is using a uh, uh, previously published data in which uh, healthy subjects were administered propofol, ket, and dex. Uh, and then what we've done is add some other analyses to that brain imaging data. So there are 16 propofol subjects, nine ketamine subjects, and 10 dex subjects. They were administered the, uh, the anesthetic agent until reaching an unresponsive state. And then the resting state fMRI was acquired. So again, sort of how, okay, I, I know I'm kind of speaking to a mixed audience. So how um, is information processing uh, its most basic form uh, investigated in uh, brain imaging? 
Well, what you do is you, you, you get a resting state fMRI scan. And uh, one of the most basic ways of, of, of looking at the, the information processing is, well, you parcelate the brain into a number of nodes and then extract the time series from, from those nodes. And then you can simply perform a, a, a correlation of each of those uh, nodes activity and time with each other. And you can end up with something like this matrix, which is a functional connectivity matrix of how correlated the activity of each uh, uh, area is with each other. But what we're actually, uh, what we know so far with um, these anesthetic agents in functional connectivity is that there is a decrease in the overall uh, connectivity between brain regions. So uh, it's fairly uh, unsurprising uh, to many of us. But also actually in resting state networks, which is the default mode network, this is a study from 2017, looking at DEXMED and Propofol, and we of course see reductions in default mode network, particularly in frontal regions, but also in that key posterior cortex node. And we also see reductions in the functional connectivity between a number of other uh, resting state uh, networks, including the salience network and uh, executive control network. So moving past this functional connectivity uh, measures, we can actually look at more kind of um, detailed uh, measures about how exactly information is processed. Because of course, all functional connectivity shows you is the correlation. Now, uh, I'm sure we all remember looking at uh, those graphs of absolutely bonkers things being correlated with each other. And we know that correlation doesn't equal causation, but we can look at some other measures which might give an inclination as to a causal um, uh, property. And the way we're going to look at this is with three measures. The first one is transfer entropy. And this is essentially you can think of as being sort of like a, a, a directional map between brain regions, giving you information as to which brain regions are broadcasting and which ones are receiving information. We also looked at synergy, which you can think of as sort of the information that emerges when two independent sources converge. So similar to sort of like um, stereoscopic uh, depth perception. Of course, when you use both eyes, you can, you can perceive depth in a much greater capacity than using one eye alone. And this is the sort of synergistic information that we're looking for in this measure. And then lastly, active information storage. This is a little bit different in the sense that what we're looking at here is an isolated measure of one particular brain area and looking at how much information is actively used from its past in predicting its future. So the more complex a signal, you would have to use more information to successfully predict its future than one that was more simple. And just so we've got these uh, measures uh, sort of uh, figured out in our head, I'm just gonna do a little analogy, which hope doesn't confuse you uh, even more. So let's imagine a group, uh, a population of people with uh, each living their own independent lives with a past, a childhood, uh, a, uh, a present, and then in a future, uh, uh, happy future elderly life. So we can think of transfer entropy as being a, a cause and interaction of, of, of one person on, on, their, on their friend. Uh, and perhaps that person might interact them back, let's say, uh, they, they started playing tennis and then this influenced their friend to start playing tennis and their future is uh, taken up by more tennis games, essentially. Do you think of synergy as being the sort of information that again, that emerges when independent sources converge? So um, you could think of this as sort of two people coming together and, and having a child and the child as being the synergistic emergent information um, that, that, that comes from those two uh, sources. And then active information storage is a little bit different as I mentioned, and it's looking at really uh, one individual person here and thinking about, okay, so how much uh, of their childhood is uh, 
important in predicting their future elderly life. So I hope that's uh, clear now on what those measures uh, stand for. So let's talk about the results. Um, and I'm gonna get the little, uh, little laser pointer out. Um, but firstly, just I just want to mention that these are preliminary results. And uh, we've actually come up, we, we, we can see a lot of uh, interesting uh, things that have, uh, that have come up and some things are quite actually hard to interpret. So if anyone does have any uh, 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 suggestions about where to take the analysis next, it'd be massively appreciated. But um, let me walk you through what we've got so far. So these are results from the transfer entropy. And what you get is a receiving capacity and a broadcasting capacity for each individual agent. And here is actually the results from a T uh, series of, of T tests between the wakefulness state and the deep sedation state. So the darker blue is the more uh, reductions in uh, transfer entropy. Okay. So firstly, what we can see as well, um, directed information flow, which is transfer entropy, is reduced in, a num in, in all the states. Um, and there were, there were uh, clear uh, local changes. And the main point is really that, that, that propofol has more widespread decreases in information uh, broadcasting and receiving compared to ketamine and dex. And the next point is, well, that uh, interestingly, ketamine has this sort of thalamic uh, preservation in receiving and broadcasting uh, bilaterally. And uh, interestingly, um, what we have is DEXNED has this uh, preservation in uh, receiving capacity in thalamic areas, but then not so much in the broadcasting capacity of the thalamus, which um, is, probably has some uh, interesting uh, implications there. And then again, something uh, quite uh, convoluted or unusual is that there's a preservation of posterior cingulate cortex in both uh, in receiving for both dex and ket so we can see a, a sort of preservation in this posterior cingulate cortex area but that's not necessarily true in the broadcasting we can see reductions in the posterior cingulate cortex on, on dex and ket so let's move on to the synergy results well what we can see firstly is a reduction in the global synergy levels in these charts on the left for each of the three uh, anesthetic agents. Um, and uh, actually importantly, it's uh, ketamine shows a, 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 a lower reduction of synergy compared to propofol index, which probably has some interesting uh, implications uh, in terms of the relationship between complexity and and, and, and synergy in these information processing measures. What we also see is that um, ketamine uh, and DEX show uh, relatively similar levels in, in, in the local uh, change in synergy. And that there's this um, frontal commonalities between the, the three states. I mean, of course, propofol has much more widespread uh, decreases in synergy, but all three have. Um, decreases in frontal uh, synergy measures, which is um, a, a, nice, a nice common finding. Again, uh, what we see is a relative preservation of thalamic regions for ketamine and, uh, and dex compared to propofol. So moving on to the active information storage uh, results, again, we see a reduction in the, um, the uh, global uh, active information storage in each of the three uh, anesthetic agents. Um, and we also see uh, that, interestingly, uh, the, this time the, the, the propofol and dexmed seem to be kind of fairly similar, actually, in their, in their spatial distributions, um, which, which is, again, a, a, a bit of an interesting one to, to interpret. Now, areas of sort of commonalities is we see medial frontal cortex in all three uh, anesthetic agents is reduced for the active information storage. And uh, uh, really compared to the sort of the other two, this, this, this lateral frontal is, is really preserved in ketamine compared to, uh, compared to the other two agents. 
So, so what's going on here? How, how can we make sense of these results? It's something that I've been bugging myself about. And um, really what the first point to say uh, is that um, clearly what we have is we have uh, anesthesia showing a reduction in information processing in the global measures and also in local measures for each of the three uh, sedative agents. Now, propofol showing the most widespread disruptions, that's clear to see. And it's probably something to do with the direct impact of propofol on uh, GABA transmission, uh, resulting in, in a more of a, a, a pharmacologically direct inhibition compared to the other two agents. Uh, also to note that, that, that propofol has a, a slower recovery time compared to the other two agents, which is probably again something to do with this deeper state of, uh, of, of sedation phenomenologically also. So the only sort of consistent uh, regional changes that we see um, are, um, are frontal. And uh, this is actually sort of backed up by uh, older functional connectivity uh, uh, studies implicating uh, the default mode network uh, alterations, but particularly a preferential uh, frontal alteration. And it even supports more, more sort of recent findings of uh, the uh, integrative capacity of the, the default mode network um, being uh, affected in these low conscious states. Uh, down here, we can see a study from uh, Lupi and colleagues looking at disorders of consciousness and uh, deep sedation and looking at this integrative capacity measure and uh, changes in regional entropy. And they found that these uh, they were common areas in, in, in default mode network regions, including uh, frontal regions and posterior cortex regions. Uh, and the sort of overlap between these two states was uh, uh, posterior cortex regions, which of course is a central node of the default mode network and, and really central to, to, to the, uh, a number of fundamental ideas about what um, structures support consciousness in the brain. So, I mean, why didn't we see this, this, this clear uh, posterior cingulate cortex uh, information processing alterations? I would have expected to, to probably see something like that. But then really sort of digging deeper, um, maybe the, the posterior regions in anesthesia are actually less, less preferentially affected, especially in uh, humans. Since animal studies have shown that you really need a very large dose to see changes in, uh, in, in posterior cortex. Uh, um, connectivity. Uh, this was a study from 2022, uh, just, a, just a couple of months ago, um, looking at the PCI, um, a measure that, that, that Paolo just introduced, actually doing the PCI in rats. And uh, they found that the ketamine one stays essentially uh, just enough ketamine to reach um, unresponsiveness for the rats. And the ketamine two state is twice that dose. And it's only actually in the ketamine two state that we see this difference in posterior uh, high, high frequency, low frequency EG measures. So really um, the, the, the difference between a, a so-called ketamine two dose and a ketamine one dose isn't really to do with the uh, responsiveness as such, but it's really deep in, reaching a much deeper level of, 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 of the drug uh, of anesthesia, which, which is not, um, seen in in uh, in, in human based uh, uh, most human based uh, imaging studies, and the same is probably true for propofol. This is uh, evidence from a 2016 EEG study, looking at the loss of behavioural response. So essentially, how uh, responsive they were to uh, you know uh, stimulation, and even at the highest dose of um, propofol there was still a, 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 a relative preservation of, of posterior regions. So it seems like um, the, the jury's still out really on, on exactly what the, uh, how much the posterior cortex is involved in anesthesia. And uh, this is a point that, that, that I will return to. But just kind of moving away from that a little bit, um, one of the other sort of nice uh, 
uh, clear things to interpret is that uh, we have preserved thalamic synergy and transfer entropy. And this does support kind of um, uh, previous uh, functional connectivity findings that say, or that suggest that the relative preservation of the thalamus uh, in DEXMED and ketamine sedation is uh, but probably reflecting the, the ability to quickly recover from um, these uh, sensitive states compared to, uh, compared to propofol. But again, I mean, the story's not as clear as that, is it? Because we have, um, looking at active information storage, we have in ketamine a decrease in thalamic active information storage. So it sort of begs the question of how are these measures um, uh, related to one another so that you can see preservation of synergy and, and the preservation of transfer entropy, but then not in active information storage. And this is the thing that I'm sort of tackling with uh, uh, right now. And uh, so we know that um, the complexity is, is, uh, is high in, in, in the ketamine administration. And um, it's a figure I'm sure you've seen a lot of today. Paolo just showed it earlier. And uh, of course, uh, Professor Carl Harris showed it earlier today too. And I'm sure many of you are aware of it. It's this uh, measures from MEG data showing that uh, the subanesthetic ketamine um, results in a higher complexity to, to, to normal waking consciousness here measured through Lempel zip. Now also, uh, there has actually been an MRI study looking at directed connectivity in psilocybin LSD and ketamine. And uh, they showed a, a uh, this, this was with Granger causality, which is actually very similar to the, the transfer entropy uh, methodology that, 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 that we use. Uh, and we see reductions in directed information processing. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, this is directly uh, in, in, in support of this study that the, the, the ketamine um, uh, results that we show also show a reduction of directed information flow. But importantly, what this is showing is that you can have this increase in complexity, but at the same time, a reduction in actual information processing which then is interesting and sort of begs the question of how are these measures exactly uh, related? And what we see in, in, in our results is we see a preservation of transfer entropy of the direct and information processing and synergy in uh, uh, ketamine and DEX relatively compared to propofol. There are still reductions, but relatively compared to propofol. And this is probably something to do with this idea that Unconsciousness doesn't necessarily uh, uh, result um, um, from this, uh, from the uh, uh, administration of these anesthetics. Um, to rephrase that, I mean, anesthesia is not necessarily unconsciousness, especially with these uh, ketamine and, and, and dex, because of course the, the experiences that you can have uh, with ketamine uh, with uh, sub-anesthetic doses, but also at anesthetic doses. I mean, evidence uh, from the from the, uh, the, the 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 rodent studies is probably. Um, showing that again, you really need these high, high doses to result in um, absolute abolition of, uh, of um, connectivity. So there's probably a maintenance of experience with these two uh, substances, which is underlying this preservation of synergy. So I'm just going to talk a little bit, um, just lastly, about um, what I'm planning to, uh, to do to, uh, to try to take this preliminary results forward. Uh, now we have the subjective reports from the ketamine uh, patients, so it'd be interesting to look at whether um, sort of on a more individual level we could see um, uh, changes in um, uh, different uh, measures of, of, of synergy and tra transfer entropy, etc, uh, that correlate with, with perhaps the subjective reports. And then maybe to make things a little bit clearer on um, uh, the regional differences, what we want to look at is uh, the light sedation to the deep sedation. So we have this data for, for quote unquote, still anesthetic uh, 
uh, ketamine. So, so it'd be interesting to look at the progression uh, through those states. Uh, also looking at redundancy in addition to synergy, it's essentially the sister measure and uh, doing, such a, uh, doing such a measure might reveal more um, um, clear cut um, roles for the individual areas. And also something that we've had to do is look at these information processing measures in the psychedelic state um, in uh, psilocybin and, and, and LSD uh, fMRI data that we are so kindly had access to uh, by um, Professor uh, Kohal Harris and colleagues. So, okay, that's, um, that's it from me. I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And of course, thank um, uh, everybody at the, the, the Coma Science Group and all, the, all my collaborators. And uh... Naji, thank you very much. Thank you. And I know we do have a question for you from the audience. Why don't you come up and speak it into their microphone? Hi, uh, very interesting talk. Um, so I was wondering, because I'm also trying to study models of unconsciousness, and I think these ways of analyzing the data are very interesting. Um, and considering that the most disruptive effects are from propofol, I was wondering if you or somebody has ever analyzed or compared these propofol with isoflurin or sibofluorine anesthesia. Well, thanks very much for the question. Um, yeah, so... Um, you, you're right in terms of uh, isoflurane and sevoflurane have, have similar uh, deep sedatory effects. And this is something that's been looked at with functional connectivity studies uh, a number of times. And uh, uh, with these functional connectivity studies, we do see similar alterations in, uh, in uh, um, resting state networks like the ones that um, I, I mentioned about default mode network, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, like you said, um, looking at these sort of uh, more, more complex information processing measures might reveal um, something interesting and actually might be a bit of a sanity check, you know, because you can sort of get a bit lost in a sea of data-driven techniques. And it might be a bit of a sanity check to check if uh, sevoflurane and, and, and similar, uh, uh, more similar drugs to, to, to propofol phenomenologically have uh, similar effects to the information processing. And uh, it's not something actually that, 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 that uh, so far we plan on doing, but, but definitely um, uh, I'm gonna bring this up because, because it, it, I think it would, might be a little bit of a, uh, a check to make sure these, these uh, measures aren't just, uh, measuring absolute uh, mathematics in the in the in the in the, the virtual realm you know <laughs> and then real quick because i'm not going to be able to ask you this in person um but i was wondering how does these measurements of like synergy and information of transfer information feed into models of unconsciousness like um seizures for example when we know that individuals lost consciousness but like the brain behaves completely different from when the individual is anesthetized yeah, for sure. I mean, it's 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 uh, something that that would be uh, great to investigate. I mean, um, sort of these measures of like directed information processing are fairly uh, new. Um, uh, I mean, completely really new in in uh, in uh, fMRI. Um, only only really in the infancy of being looked at, and um, applying them to things like uh, seizure and epilepsy uh, is is something that's. Um, is a uh, very very interesting to do. Actually, yeah, I've just uh, just thought about that. A colleague, um, a colleague that's actually just defending his his PhD next week is uh, is is planning on doing his postdoctoral research on these exact measures in uh, in uh, epilepsy uh, type uh, uh, modeling. So uh, you, you can look forward to that research from from uh, from him in the future. Quick question about the study design that led to the data that you um, used in your analysis. Is it is it true that the um, the subjects who were given the three different agents had doses that gave the same depth of sedation? Yes. So uh, the, it was assessed through a uh, Ramsey score, which is essentially a uh, uh, way of measuring uh, unresponsiveness. And uh, I believe that um, it was assessed through uh, sort of response to command and, and uh, so-like 
measures. But yeah, they did indeed re result in the same uh, depth of uh, uh, okay. sedation. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naji, for the strong finish for the evening. Thank you, everyone. I guess Thanks we can much. say you're the last women standing. <laughs> and thank you all for listening today to the Psychedelic Symposium this evening. Um, we've had a wonderful time bringing you this information, and we look forward to seeing you uh, tomorrow morning, 8.30, the big talk. Thank you, everyone. Good night. <laughs>